Julie Perrine is my guest today. Talk about being organized. Julie is an administrative expert, author, and procedures pro. She is the founder of a website called All Things Admin, where she provides training, resources, and career advice to admins worldwide. She equips admins with tools, systems, and career potential. I guarantee that after listening to Julie, you will be inspired to get yourself more organized or you'll be convinced that you need a virtual assistant. iHire connects you to industry-specific jobs in over 57 talent communities. Find your niche today on iHire. Thank you for being here with me today, Julie. I'm very excited to talk to you about your career and your path and your business, all things admin. Thank you for having me. It's delightful to be here. So I'm curious how you went from being an administrative professional, supporting all of these C-suite executives to becoming a trainer and an author. Well, I often joke that I think I've held just about every title you can have between receptionist and executive assistant. And when I went back and actually wrote them down at one point, I'm like, hmm, there's not too many missing there. So, but really I did, I guess I got started as a receptionist and just kind of kept working my way up and really enjoyed all of the positions, had some really good executives for the most part, but Throughout most of my early career, I always kind of felt like I was waiting for things to happen to me or for you know somebody to kind of tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, have you thought about this? Or I had one executive that said, have you ever considered getting some certifications? And I was like, oh, I didn't even know they existed. Oh, no. <laughs> and so that was kind of just one of those things that, you know, it, I was having success and I was enjoying the work and I felt like I was very well suited for it. But I didn't really have any like major goals or like, you know, this big vision of what I could achieve that was kind of moving me forward. And it was at my last corporate position where I found myself working for an absolutely fantastic executive in probably one of the most toxic worker environments that you can imagine. And that was where I decided that I, it kind of felt like, you know, I was kind of getting into this cycle on my resume about every three years I was switching jobs. And while today that sounds like a long time back then, it was starting to kind of feel like job hopping to me. And so I'm like, you know what? I I don't want to keep going round and round working corporately like this any longer. I want to do something really different. And I wanted to still leverage the skills that I had gained over the course of my career up to that point. So it was um, January of 2005 that I left the corporate world and launched my virtual assistant business. And I have been a business owner ever since. But when I first got started as a virtual assistant, a lot of my clients were small businesses who didn't have any staff at all, Mm -hmm. or they were in that growth phase of, you know, I just need your help on or your specific expertise on certain projects. But as they got bigger and were growing, they would need more permanent on-site assistance. So I didn't want to go back to working corporately and I didn't want to be tied to just one client. I was enjoying the variety of my virtual um, clients at that point. So I started helping them train their new team members and then getting those procedures in place for that transition to be able to take what I was doing for them, pass it off to their new person and get them up and running. As I was doing that, a lot of those, you know, clients that I was working with were either developing their own training programs or, you know, were writing books and becoming published authors themselves. And all of those things kind of came crashing together then for me as well, because I realized that I loved training assistants as much as I enjoyed being one, maybe even more. And then that was why I decided to launch All Things Admin in the summer of 2009. So about four years after I had started my virtual assistant business. And so then the goal of that was to just kind of create this hub and to be a connector for training, mentoring, and resources that could help support admins on their career journey as well. And the next natural step of that was becoming an author for me. I love to read. I love to write. I love to research. And so I'd helped my clients become published authors and knew what that process looked like. So then I got started working on my own project and published my first book in 2012. And I am up to four books so far, have a few more ideas on the horizon, but so far that's where I'm at. So the virtual assistant really intrigues me. How do you do that when you're not on site with somebody? You can't be there and and just be the hands-on person and getting things organized for them. How do you do this virtually? Well, I realized when I was working corporately that the vast majority of the communication that I had with my executive was still through cell phone phone calls 
and through email at that point. We didn't have texting like we do now. But when I realized I could do the majority of what I was doing for him, whether I was sitting in the office next to him or sitting in an office across town from him or even sitting two states away from him, I'm like, we don't really have that much you know, one-on-one conversation throughout the day. He was in meetings most of the day. He would message me or send emails to me from the conference room that he was sitting in. And I thought, if I can do this sitting in an office next to him, and a lot of our communication is remote for all practical purposes, mm-hmm. I can do this. You know, Back in 2005, there were only probably about 4,000 virtual assistants globally. So it was just an emerging field at that point. And I was like, I know I can do this. And I mean, I look at what I started with and how I was doing it, the technology that I was using. And you know, basically, as long as you had email and a phone, you could connect with them. That part wasn't hard. And I knew how to use the Microsoft Office suite. I learned how to use the Google suite. And all of these things you know, were the, the primary tools that I was using to do my work corporately. So then doing work virtually, it didn't really take a lot of extra things. Where I had to really expand my skill set was in getting on the web. And so being able to do uh, websites and do website updates for people, being able to um, get social media figured out. I was anti-social media from the moment I first heard about it. I'm like, who needs a, you know, it just felt like a colossal waste of time. I don't need another time drain in my life. But then my clients started asking me to figure it out for them. And I was like, oh, crud. So <laughs> now I have to do this. Yeah. 2009, my, my goal for that year was fully online in 09. And it was in the middle of that year then that I also launched All Things Admin. So it really has been an, an evolution. And now, you know, shoot, the things that uh, the t- people on my team are doing for me, I have a, a virtual remote team that works with me today. I have a team of, I think right now we've got eight people wow. in states across the U.S. And only at one point in my career has any one of them been able to come in and work with me. And that was when I still lived in Iowa and she lived just down the street from me. But otherwise, we have worked successfully virtually for the better part of 18 years. And you just you use the, the tools and technology that are available. But as long as you can pick up the phone and have a phone conversation or send an email and the, the communication skills are certainly important. But doing what you do sitting behind a corporate desk isn't significantly different working virtually. It's just a little bit of a different communication structure. You've trained a lot of admins over the years. What are some of the key attributes and skills that really make someone successful in this career? Well, one of the big ones that from a big, broad category perspective, I would say is emotional intelligence. And within that, I break that down into a few subcategories specifically. I am certified in Myers-Briggs as a personality assessment. And so I always say any anything you can understand about personality type, whether you're using a tool like Myers-Briggs or DISC or Colors or any of those tools, they are a phenomenal resource for helping you be emotionally intelligent about yourself and becoming more emotionally intelligent and aware of those that you're working with and supporting so that you can tailor your communication and your style and the way you work to the way that they function best also. So I think that is a huge one um, with the personality type. I'm also a huge fan of the Strengths Finder assessment that Marcus Mm -hmm. Buckingham and the Gallup group um, have made world famous. On the same, by the same token, like understanding your strengths, but also understanding your weaknesses and knowing how those display in the workplace and how those are perceived so that you can do the things that you need to do or surround yourself with the people or resources that you need to be as effective as you can possibly be because we all have weak spots. It was just part of how we're made. But knowing how to fill those gaps appropriately is a huge key, especially for administrative professionals, because people expect us to know how to do everything. And a lot of times we're really good at a lot of things, but we also need to know where we've got gaps and how to fill them. And then the third component of that from an emotional intelligence perspective, for me, there's one book that I did not write, (laughs) I wish I had, that I recommend to every human alive. And it is Crucial Conversations, Tools for Talking When Stakes Are High. And that book and mastering the content in that book and how to just be able to have emotionally intelligent conversations, especially when it's critical and something's not maybe going right, is a game changer, especially in admins and the, the work that they do. So those the emotional intelligence piece is big of it, a big part of it. But 
The other thing that for me with assistance, and I talk about this in my first book, The Innovative Admin, business acumen, like understanding as much as you possibly can about how a business runs, how it makes money, what your role is in that process, and how the decisions that you make impact that bottom line. And sometimes we can get lost in, you know, well, I'm, I'm just an admin. No, you're no. not just an admin. You are a strategic business partner who has an insight and a, a position that gives you access to knowledge and information that not everybody has. And you need to be able to know when something is off or doesn't seem right or could maybe add value someplace else and be able be willing to present or speak up when those opportunities occur. But part of that is also understanding when and how to do that and being smarter about business, I think helps a lot of people do that. So those are two of my big ones. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of other, you know, traits and things that you could certainly list, but I think the more assistants can really embrace not just doing the the clerical work or doing some of the project work, but embrace being that value added business partner and developing those those higher level skills for you know cognitive thinking and strategic thinking and problem solving. Those are going to be some of the things that truly prepare you for the the opportunities and challenges that cross your desk, but also prepare you for being able to advance into higher level positions throughout your career. I, I feel like this is a personal counseling session for me now, but could you share some <laughs> insights into how to become more organized and efficient in our work? I thought that I was pretty organized, but talking to you, I think that you're taking it to a whole new level. <laughs> I, I'm going to learn from you. You're going to inspire me. Well, I always, with especially with assistants, but I think this applies to everybody as well, is you always need to look at, as a starting point, in my opinion, what's your system for how you manage your time and tasks? So if somebody walks up to your desk and gives you a task or somebody shoots you a request by email, how does it get into your system so that you're sure that it's going to get accomplished? So there are a few ways you can can go th- go about this. I typically like to have some sort of a hybrid between paper and digital because I am more of a paper person than digital, but digital is a necessary evil in the world we live in. So I like to capture in digital and then prioritize on paper. And so I'll start my to-do list for each day on paper and then I like to check things off. And if I add something to it, I like to add an extra box so that I get credit for it and it just keeps me too. on track. I do too. <laughs> so... But that I think is one of the spots. So, you know, how do you capture? So if I'm out and about, I have a little portable journal that is about the size of my smartphone. So I have the two of them side by side in my purse. I can quickly pull it out, jot a note down. I could certainly open an app and capture something there. But I typically, I don't like to, I'm too much of a perfectionist to use an app when I'm out and about and I hate typing with my finger. So I just use a little digital or portable journal. And then when I get back to my desk, I'll enter things in my um, system on my computer. So that's one thing. I'm um, making sure that you can access it, whether if, if you're out and about, use the app or if you want to handwrite it. But then when you get back to your desk, part of your system is sitting down and getting it right into your, your project management tool or whatever you're using. But then another key there is putting start dates and due dates on your tasks. Because if you're only putting due dates, you don't know when to start working on it or it doesn't show up on your calendar or your project management tool until it's too late. And so I, I know a lot of people who put the due dates as when they're supposed to start. I'm like, no, use almost every project management tool or task tool now has a start date and a due date. Use them. They're there yeah. for a reason. But when I am um, doing my organization training, I have like a, a starting point for, you know, first of all, declutter as much as possible. We don't realize how much of the stuff that's in front of us is actually creating visual distractions, whether we realize it or not. And so there's just enough distractions in our environment as it is. Get rid of as much of the chaos and clutter around you as you possibly can, even if that means, you know, once a day or once a week, you've got to, you know, stop and clear the decks. Another tip I'll share, I'm a huge fan of color coding digitally and in print. And a lot of times the color code you have should be able to be replicated across both if, if and where you have the ability to do that. So for me, you know, everything, if I pull up my calendar right now and showed it to you, and if I didn't have my glasses on and I can't read it, I can still tell you just by seeing the color, which blocks of time are speaking, which blocks of time are training, which blocks of time are client calls, which blocks of time are team calls because of how I have things color coded. And so then 
those digital colors carry across into my paper folders. So if I have a red file on my desk, it coordinates with the speaking engagements that are red on my calendar. So those kinds of things are really helpful to me so that I'm, I'm replicating as much as possible my digital world and make, pulling that across into my physical world so that I you know, know when I see something red on my desk, it's a really important speaking engagement related thing. So those are a, a few of them. The other thing... <laughs> People who um, get to know me or start following us at allthingsadmin.com will quickly figure out that I'm a huge proponent of systems and procedures for keeping you on track and organized in how you get things done consistently. And so I always tell people, start by leveraging all of those forms, templates, and checklists that you've created you know, for various reasons. Pull those together and don't be a afraid to use those on a regular basis. Like There's things I do on a consistent basis, but I still pull out my checklist to make sure I did it right. So preparing to sit down to do a recording, I'm like, did I plug my Cat5 in? Did I turn my lights on? Do I have my speakers? You know, is this muted? Is this email turned off? These are things your brain doesn't need to remember for you. It can be doing much higher level cognitive work. So let the checklist help you get it right. And then you move on. So those are some of the things that I do and tactics that I use for staying organized and keeping everything moving forward. The thing is not you know, my system might not work for you. Your system might not work for me. Everybody's got to find their own system that works for them, but they have to have a system. That's where I love the personality type and work style stuff again, because there are ways you can take, you know, one of my core systems and adapt it for every personality type or every work style to make it work. So, you know, some of these things may not be as important to you as they are to me or may not work as well for you in the exact same way they do for me, but the core principles that are there are still solid. And so you just figure out how to adapt it for yourself or how to adapt it for your executive or your manager or the team that you're working with so that everybody can benefit from it ultimately. Can you share one key lesson? I know you have four books, but do you have just one lesson that overall you share with everyone and they have that reaction to it. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't know this already. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know if this one is so much a um, one like the practical one like that, but I, one of the things that I have had to get comfortable with myself as an entrepreneur and a business owner, as an assistant, a lot of what I needed to do on a consistent basis needed to be right. I mean, I'm going to say, you know, it, it needed to be perfect, if at all possible, as much as perfect mm -hmm. can be achieved in this lifetime. But perfection can be a really devastating state of mind to exist in because what you need to be pursuing is excellence, not perfection. And so I had to, I kind of had to make that shift. Well, then when I became a business owner, what I figured out was the making of mistakes <laughs> is something that's going to happen consistently if you're doing anything worthwhile. Right. And so my first book is The Innovative Admin. And one of the, the key principles that I try to help people get comfortable with in that book is innovation and pursuing a career that's worth pursuing or doing anything that's worth pursuing is a messy, time-consuming, and sometimes expensive process. And it doesn't matter if you're building a business or you're building a career. So you've got to decide what it is you want to do. I'm big on planning. I'm big on documentation. So <laughs> create that plan that helps map out that path to get you there and go after it. And there's, there's going to be lots of detours and delays and distractions, but you're going to be more likely to reach the goal when you've actually got a plan in place that can help you course correct or get you back on track throughout the process. And so it's kind of that combination of embracing the innovation process, which sounds glamorous, but really is messy in the middle and sticking to the plan of attack that you laid out for yourself and surrounding yourself with, with people who can help encourage and support you on, along the way. It makes a huge difference. Right now, we're hearing so much about artificial intelligence and AI and how it's going to take jobs. And my thought in it is that AI is not going to take your job. It will be the people who know how to use AI who will take your job. What do you see on the horizon uh, for AI with your profession? Well, I often joke, we've been trying to clone ourselves for years. And now that there's this tool that sort of yes. you know, tells us it maybe can help us do that, we're all suddenly like lividly afraid of it. I'm like, I wish I'd had this years ago. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> like I, I can think of, of two specific examples and I, I still laugh about this today. Uh, one of them was my executive asked me to write a letter of recommendation for one of his golf buddies kids who was sending an application in for college. I didn't know his golf buddy. I mean, I knew who he was, but I didn't know him. I didn't know his kid. I knew nothing about his skills or abilities. And I didn't even have the first clue about how to write a letter of recommendation for somebody for this particular purpose. So back then, you know, you go pull that big volume of, you know, professional business letters off the shelf and try to find something that you can cobble something together. And then my executive took his red pen to it. And I was like, well, you should have written in the first place. But (laughs) today I'm like, man, I would just take what I knew, plug it into chat GPT and see what it spit out for me. Like in, you know, less than five seconds, I'd have had a letter and saved myself all kinds of wear and tear. So I think of all the different things, you know, whether you're you're trying to reply back to somebody, all of the examples of going into my boss's sent items, trying to see how he crafted a message so that I could write something similar to that and how long those things took me that now these Mm -hmm. AI tools can do in a matter of split seconds is just incredible to me. I have been playing around with AI tools for writing procedures. That has been a fascinating experiment and one that I think people are going to be able to use to speed up the process. So I wanted to test it myself and see, okay, here are the things I already know how to do or I already have procedures on, but I'm going to see what this tool can create if I give it a few prompts. Mm -hmm. And I have been blown away by how close to accurate they were, you know, a few things that need to be tweaked, but man, talk about how fast I can put some inputs in and get something out to then edit and finalize all in like a matter of, you know, 15, 20 minutes time versus taking me several hours. Game changer. So I, I'm like you, like, I know that this is, you know, for some people it, it feels intimidating. It feels like it could put you out of work. It feels like it could, you know, maybe take your job. I say that the the innovative admin is the antidote to artificial intelligence because I think most of those headlines that we're seeing out there are mostly clickbait anyway. Mm-hmm. But someone who is truly functioning at a high level is not at risk of being replaced by AI. In fact, it's the, the opposite is true. And so you've got to be actively engaged in that learning and growing and expanding your skills process so that you're the one figuring out how to use it. So you're teaching others and you're the one who's bringing it into your organization, not the one who it's being forced upon. And right. I think that'll make the biggest difference for a lot of assistants in particular. But I think anyone in any profession who knows that there's a tool like this that could potentially do parts of what they're currently doing, you know what? Some of those things you didn't want to be doing anyway. So figure out how to use your talent or resources for the things where you are adding more value than just an AI tool can. I love to show it to people for the first time. I I love to say, well, what what do you want to do with this? And let's do it. And just watch how amazed they are when they see how quickly ChatGPT produced something and then how accurate it is. You know, it's not that you're going to copy and paste directly from this, but wow, if it can give you a head start and get you 75% of the way there, why not use it? Why not leverage that to to make yourself more productive? Yeah, for a variety of reasons. I'm not comfortable like having it write my next book for me, but for brainstorming ideas or brainstorming titles or brainstorming my outline or even using it for taking what I've already written and converting that into some social media posts, it's an absolutely brilliant tool for some of those types mm-hmm. of things or helping me create headlines or subject lines for my emails. I've been do- I've been doing that for years using other tools that I'm sure are bringing elements of AI into them and I just didn't know it. So, you know, it's, it's just a matter of learning how it can be used um, authentically, genuinely and legally and tapping into how you can be the one to bring it in before someone else is telling you, hey, this is going to take that job from you. <laughs> yes, Exactly. Based on your career, what is the one piece of advice that you think could really benefit our audience as they navigate their own career paths? Well, when it comes to careers, I have a motto. And that motto is start here, go anywhere. And what I mean by that is where you're at today is simply the starting point. You don't have to be married to this for the rest of your life. You can, you can be here as long as you want to be. You can be here for as short as you want to be. And what I've 
come to observe more frequently, especially now, is no one wants to feel trapped in their first job after college anymore. And nobody is staying in their you know jobs or their careers to the same length of time as, as most of our parents and grandparents did. It's, it's not even a real, realistic expectation, unfortunately, in some cases. But the role you're in now can be rewarding and be a fantastic training ground for whatever it is you decide to pursue next. It's simply your starting point. So I like to encourage people to look at it as it may not be, it may be the best thing ever. And if it is great, do it for as long as you can. It may just be a, "Mm, yeah, this this is paying the bills for today, but this is not what I want to do. Ultimately, that's okay. Use it to prepare you for what you do want to do next and how you want to take action on that career plan that you've mapped out for yourself. Because what I know is that every single person has a potential that is beyond their expectations, but they are the ones who ultimately have to decide what they want to do with where they're at today. So start here, go anywhere, but ultimately you, the individual gets to decide that. Well, Julie, I think that you just titled the podcast for us. That's perfect. Start here, go anywhere. I'm going to use that. It's been a pleasure having you here today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the invitation.